kind of a, a sobering introduction <coughs> to the message, but nonetheless, it's right from Scripture, and uh, that's what we want to do. I'm listening to some old Billy Graham interviews, and he always said, this is what the Bible says. This is what the Word of God says. So in interviews and wherever he was found and people were asking <laughs> questions concerning what he believed, he always went back to the Scriptures. And I trust that will always be where we find our source of wisdom, strength, and direction from. It's from the Scriptures. Because God can defend himself very, very well. He doesn't need our help. But we just need to be faithful and effective with using God's word in a way that uh, presents his truth. And that's our responsibility. So hello, people. It's a new angle here. <laughs> so our one spectator. <laughs> Welcome. All right. So this morning, my question is, are you ready? For a sudden attack. Better yet, how would you respond if you were face to face with the enemy? Well, here's one person's response when faced with the enemy. There was an elderly woman who had just returned to her home from an evening at a church service when she was startled by an intruder. As she caught the man in the act of robbing her home of its valuables, she yelled, Stop! Acts 2.38, which means, which says, turn from your sin. The burglar stopped dead in his tracks. Then the woman calmly called the police and explained what she had done. As the officer cuffed the man to take him in, he asked the burglar, Why did you just stand there? All the old lady did was yell a scripture at you. Scripture, replied the burglar. She said she had an axe and two thirty-eights. <laughs> well, it depends on how you interpret axe two thirty-eight. <laughs> but we never know when we're going to be confronted with the enemy. And that's what Paul is... Uh, uh, conveying here in Ephesians chapter 6, there is an enemy, and for this enemy, Paul is removing the veil and, and so that we can enter into and see the realm, the invisible realm. He talks about it being the heavenly realm, that there's this war going on and being waged. And in one sense, it's a scary proposition but Paul is encouraging the believers, I'm telling you, this is the situation so that you can be prepared when the evil day comes, when you find yourself under attack. David Wilkerson spells out very clearly what this uh, is all about for the Christian and what they experience in a post from... Uh, March of 2007, and you know David Wilkerson probably from uh, The Cross and the Switchblade in that movie there, uh, which is based on a true story as well. But he writes this, if you're a Christian who seeks God with your whole heart, you are a target. He says, I'm speaking to those who endure deep trials and perhaps are worn out emotionally, physically, or spiritually. We live in a time of great stress when trials can come upon us suddenly and leave us overwhelmed, weary, and confused. I thank God for every Christian who right now is enjoying this season of blessings. Your life isn't under great stress and you're not facing trying tests or deep pain. I'm grateful to the Lord. He is providing such seasons in his children's lives. Yet, we know from Scripture that storms and great trials come to all who have truly given everything to Christ. See, even the Apostle Paul says, not if the evil day comes, but when the day of evil comes. 
Psalm 34 verse 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Moreover, if you hunger after the Lord, if you're determined to seek Him with your whole heart, you will continually be a target of the devil's envy. And so we have testimony of our contemporaries, but we also have the testimony of Scripture that there's an enemy against us. And perhaps we have personal testimony ourselves that we've experienced times when, where is this affliction coming from? Where is this pain? Why are my thoughts going in that direction? I don't know exactly how uh, Satan can influence and attack. It's presented in Scripture. We need to believe it. But we don't know all uh, understanding how these attacks occur or when they attack or why they... Well, we, we did discuss why they uh, do occur. However, we can better be prepared for them. And so the Apostle Paul talks about the armor of God. So as we begin this uh, message this morning, if you have your Bibles, would you turn again with me to Ephesians chapter 6. So the Apostle Paul, of course, this is one of the prison epistles. And as the Apostle Paul was maybe chained to somebody, chained to a guard, or perhaps there was a guard watching over him, and he, he could have been under house arrest. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul looked at this guard and looked at the armor he was wearing. And in so doing, thought to himself with his spiritual imagination, huh, this is how we should dress, how we should be prepared as Christians. So the Apostle Paul took the armor of a soldier and applied it to the Christian life. And how we need to be wearing the armor that God has provided for us already. When he uses the terms put on, really what he's saying is apply what God has already given to you. Just like in, chap just like in a previous chapter, he says we should take off the clothes, uh, the old clothes, and put on the new clothes. And of course we've been made a new creation in Christ Jesus. But we need to wear it. Wear what we say we claim to be. And that's what he's saying here, but except he's making uh, reference uh, to a soldier and how we can appreciate Christian uh, the battles that we're in and how we should respond by looking at a military soldier and the armament that they wear. So we're at verse 15. We've already started with uh, the belt of truth and we continued last week with the breastplate of righteousness. And so this morning, we are going to talk about the boots. The boots that bring peace in times of trouble. Question, how many things have you been preparing for this past week? Month or year to date? Preparation is an important step to success. At least that's what all the experts tell us. We need to be prepared for uh, our financial uh, uh, situation. We need to be prepared for employment. We need to be prepared for marriage. We need to be prepared for raising children. We need to be prepared for this, prepared for that. And like we're constantly thinking about being prepared. Well, that's so true in the spiritual realm as well, in our Christian walk with the Lord. We need to be ready. Look what verse 15 says. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Go big. Let's go big. Feet first. And so the Apostle Paul, as he considered the Roman soldier, and he saw the, their, their feet and, and the boots that they were wearing, we notice that he doesn't mention shoes, but we can assume that. In ancient times, the soldier needed to be ready for battle. It doesn't mean he was always in battle. But he could be. Just, that's just why urgence, urgence uh, sante, or uh, 911, they are ready. They're usually ready, even though they're not constantly 
ministering to patients or driving to homes, they're ready. You look at the Tim Hortons and you see them there. <laughs> they're ready. Um, but the idea is we always have to be ready. The soldier was always ready, just in case. And how he was, uh, how his, was related to his boots and, if, and how he was wearing them really showed if he was ready or not. Imagine a fully armed soldier. He has all the armament on. As we, he's got the belt of truth on. He's got the breastplate of righteousness. And he's got the shield of faith. And he's got all of these things on, but he doesn't have the shoes. What does that tell you? He's not ready. Because there's no shortage of uh, hazards on the field. Once you're called in to do it, you got to go. And if you don't have the shoes on your feet, these military boots, you, there's all kinds of debris, uh, twigs and stones and metal pieces. Who knows what you're going to step on? So you need to be ready. Not only is protection from hazards, but these boots also provided security and stability. We've got snow boots today. Gertrude, you were showing me your, your boots you, you got um, on Wednesday. And if you look at the bottom of the boot, you've also got, they're stunning. Uh, because we have our own battles in this corner of the re region of the world. It's called snow and ice. And we need to be ready when we're called out to that Bible study and prayer meeting and Mrs. Stins. We don't want to fall. So we've got, uh, though we're ready with our boots that have uh, some type of uh, metal pieces or studs at the bottom so they can grip onto the ice. And they would have nails at the bottom, these soldiers, of their boots so that when they're walking along, they can keep their balance. You know, what does this, all this mean to you and me as Paul relates it to um, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace? Jesus said it this way. He's come to give us, leave us with his peace. He said, in the world you will have trouble. But be of good courage or take heart. I have overcome the world. You see, Jesus was saying that to his disciples in Acts, excuse me, John chapter 16. He says, I'm going away. And where I'm going, you can't come. But be of good courage. Don't think that I've left you. Don't think that I've forsaken you. Don't think that I've lost. But I'm going. And you will have trouble in this world. But he has promised his peace. You see, the prepper, it says, the readiness with your feet fitted, with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The readiness is also recognizing that in this world we will have trouble. It's not an if, but it's a when. It's not a possibility, but it's a guarantee. And so if we're ready for that, we can be reminded of the peace that God provides for us. In other words, we prepare ourselves now. We learn to experience the peace of God, the gospel of peace. It says the gospel of peace. The word gospel there means good news. Now oftentimes when we think of good news and the gospel of peace, we think of going and advancing of preaching. But I don't think that's the emphasis here in this text, within this context, because in this context, we're to be standing against. We're not to be advancing. We're not to be going. We're to be hunkering down. This is for the Christian that we can enjoy and experience the peace of God. From day to day. This is the peace in times of trouble. In times of division. When our, when our souls are divided. Could be divided. Because of the issues of life. The worries of life that we're going through. God gives us a peace. In the midst of a storm. 
He doesn't take the storm away from us, but he can give us that peace. We need to be ready for the storms in advance and be preparing for them, learning what it means to enjoy the peace of God. So when the battle occurs and the evil day is upon us and it will come, there's so many different ways in which we can describe evil, whether it's persecutions or, or whether it's problems and circumstances, afflictions of some kind. We all go through them. And for the believer, we're not excluded from them because we are Christians. In fact, we will be afflicted perhaps more so by them because we have an enemy, a spiritual enemy, as the Bible says. And so we need to be reminded of that. Do you remember in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the people of Judah were about to be invaded by the powerful enemies of the Ammonites and the Moabites? They were afraid. But the Lord spoke to King Jehoshaphat and said, Do not be afraid nor dismayed by reason of the great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. You see, in the battles of life that we go through, we can be reminded that God is in control and that the Lord will take care of us. The Lord will minister to us. And that gives us a sense of peace and calmness in times of trouble and division and discord within our own soul. And we'll remove it from us. So we need to be reminded about having our uh, feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace, it's a result of trusting in or having confidence in God. Allow me to share some promises that bring us peace in times of trials. We are loved by the Lord. We are saved by grace. And we are kept by grace. We are his children. And we are in the tender care of the good shepherd who protects us, keeps us, and defends us, and delivers us. <clears throat> you see, that, that gives us a peace that can overwhelm us and remove the fears that may keep us from enjoying the peace of God. Not only so, but as we think of um, the armor that God has provided, we also need to consider faith. It's all about faith. Faith is for the purpose of protection and courage to stand against doubt and fear. I heard last week that there was a minister who left the church because he said he lost his faith. And that's, that, that's, that's a sad, sad uh, statement to hear somebody make. But perhaps you're here this morning you're saying, boy, I really don't know where my faith is. It's being shaken. And sometimes our faith is shaken. Something happens in our lives that can just rob us of our joy. We have no peace and we can question our faith. What's it all about? Is God really there for me? Well, faith is important. The Bible says faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Look, what, look how he compares faith in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 6. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith was important to a Roman soldier. Really important to a Roman soldier. It provided a great deal of protection because of its sheer size. It wasn't just one of these little uh, dollar store shields. You know, the kind that does this made out of plastic and it might last a, a week or two. It was huge. It could be three and a half feet uh, long by three feet wide, and it was able to provide protection for the whole of the soldier almost when they were positioned, when the attacks came. They could hide behind it. 
What kind of attacks are these? This seems like an alarming type of attack that's mentioned here. It talks about um, a flaming, flaming arrows. The other attacks were not so clear what kind they are, but the flaming arrows here. When I think of flaming arrows, what makes these attacks so serious and so dangerous is that flaming arrows can come out of anywhere, from behind anywhere. You see, it, when it's battle, caught, war, waging war against an enemy that you see approaching, it's easier to prepare. However, when we talk about flaming arrows, they can come behind places that the soldiers are hidden and all of a sudden we see these flaming arrows, unanticipated circumstances and situations. And all of a sudden, the soldier finds themselves in real trouble. And they need to have the shield of faith because the shield of faith would protect them. They would just hide behind them. Again, this is about standing your ground. Sometimes you can do no better than hide behind the shield of faith. Did I say you can do no better? That's definitely the case. That's what we should learn to do, is live by faith. And in so doing, we will protect ourselves from an onslaught of attacks that were not anticipated, perhaps. God will not allow us to be tempted more than we can handle. And with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape. So we're just there, Lord, I'm just standing my ground. I'm, I want to live by faith, but this is almost too much. I can't bear it anymore. God will give you the strength to endure. That living faith will hold that shield in place. One of the songs we sang this morning, uh, it, was talk, it was mentioning God is our shield. You know, in the Old Testament, the shield is God. If we think of uh, Proverbs 30 and verse 5, it says, God is a shield to those who put their trust in him. It is, the, our faith is in God to complete the thought from the Old to the New Testament. When that's real faith, when we're being assaulted by the enemy in such a way. God, look what it says in Genesis 15, 1, where God said to Abraham, I will be your shield. It's also important to note, one of the flaming arrows that Satan throws is those that cause us to doubt God and his grace, which creates an attitude of uncertainty. Pastor Rick Warren provides some effective practical counsel about doubt. He said this, Doubt your doubts and believe your beliefs. You see, many believers do the exact opposite. As soon as we have doubts, oh, I'm going to believe that doubt. Those doubts are real. And all that we've lived for in the past up to this point, our belief in the Lord and living by faith, we question. But we need to doubt our doubts. So when doubt comes along, that's not from God. And believe your beliefs. <coughs> Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Really, this is the Christian life. And Paul is just breaking it down by looking at a Roman soldier so we can understand and appreciate it better and making application. Perhaps in our time, in our day, uh, maybe the terms that would be used is uh, put on the full gear of a hockey player. Uh, <laughs> especially in Canada. We don't understand that one. But back then, the Ephesian believers would know exactly what he's talking about as he makes illustration and uses this metaphorical language. Not only so, we're not done yet. The last piece of equipment of armor that we need to put on um, is what? In verse 17. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Well, let's just stop with the helmet of salvation. To me, this speaks of preservation. If the last uh, statement speaks of, the shield of faith speaks of protection, this speaks of preservation. The helmet was put on last and vital to the survival of protecting what? 
What is up here that needs to be protected? Perhaps in my case, not a whole lot. Uh, but it's, that's where our brain is. That's where our mind is. We think. The rest of the armor would be useless if we didn't have on the helmet of salvation and we were hit on the head. In the spiritual battles, the Christian must endure. When enduring, also, it's essential that we have our thoughts. Where are our thoughts when things are going difficult? When we find we're under attack? When we can say, this is an evil day? Where, where do our, our thoughts are oftentimes in the gutter? We need to get our thoughts out of the gutter and get them on God. Especially in times when the spiritual battles are so severe that we need to think on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. But it talks about the helmet of salvation. In what sense is it the helmet of salvation? Well, sometimes the Bible refers to salvation as simply deliverance. God will deliver us in his time. No matter how difficult the day is, there will be another day, a new day, perhaps a better day. But let me also say, the best day is yet to come for the believer. You may be having a good day today. You may be having a little bit of heaven here on earth. Praise the Lord. But I'll tell you what, you won't have all of heaven here on earth. You have to go to heaven. You see, ultimate deliverance Ultimate salvation, I believe, is what the Apostle Paul is referring to here about the helmet of salvation. No matter how difficult it gets here on earth, and we, God does not guarantee us that all of a sudden things are going to become rosy and better, but we, here on earth, but they will become perfect when we enter eternity for the believer. To be absent in body is to be present with the Lord. That's the great hope of salvation that the believer has. The helmet of salvation. So when I've got that helmet on, Lord, and when it's going difficult, I, it, God wants to us to be thinking that much more about eternity with Him. And that helps to protect our thoughts and minds from wandering, from focusing on the enemy too much, becoming discouraged, our minds going into the gutter. We need to be encouraged with that. In 1 Thessalonians 5.8, it, it is the hope of salvation, the helmet of salvation, where Paul uses the same terminology, the hope of salvation. It's a future salvation, not a positional salvation when a believer receives Christ as Savior, but a prospective salvation when we enter eternity. And we're with the Lord forever. The Apostle Paul would write in his final letter to Timothy, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. The ultimate salvation will be realized in God's heavenly kingdom. I said, Lord, why did I doubt? Why did I fear? Why was my thoughts not always on this great salvation that I now am experiencing? Looking into the eyes of Jesus. My question to each of you here this morning, do you have that hope? Do you have that hope? Is that a real confidence that you know you're preserved by God's grace? We, we considered a passage last week in John, as we're studying through it, that nobody can snatch. Nobody, we can, the believer cannot be snatched out of the hand of God because he's protecting us in his loving care of us. Is the helmet important? Let me share this story. It's hard to deny the importance of the helmet. That's true. The Lansing State Journal ran an article on June 23, 2009, about a 36-year-old involved in a skateboarding accident. It was a death that could have been avoided, the official said. <coughs> Paul Maxson, 
who was not wearing a helmet, suffered a skull fracture and other head injuries in an accident June 18th at Rainy Skate Park near Frandor. He died that Saturday. A simple helmet would have saved his life, said the Lansing Fire Public Information Officer Steve Mazurk. The story stands in stark contrast with an article that appeared in the Manchester Evening News on July 4th, 2008. Savannah Hayward, 11, was knocked unconscious after falling into the path of a car. The wheels went over her arm and the top of her helmet, but she escaped with a swollen elbow and bruising to her face. You see, her parents say she would have been killed without the helmet and now are urging all cyclists to wear helmets. It makes sense. You see, it's an incredible thing to think that the absence or presence of a helmet can make so much of a difference that a skateboarding accident can prove fatal without one while being run over by a car can be survived with one. One of the pieces of our spiritual armor is the helmet of salvation. And as we can see in these two stories, a helmet is not a piece of equipment to be underestimated. Let us make full use of the helmet of salvation, of our feet uh, fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel, and in addition to all, take up the shield of faith. We can apply these truths to our lives because of what is represented to us here this morning as we partake of the Lord's table and these elements. The person of Jesus Christ, he purchased our salvation. He gave the ultimate sacrifice, not for himself, but so that our sins could be forgiven, that we could have the promise and hope of eternal salvation with him. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for all that you've provided for us so that we can stand against the enemy and his attacks in the evil day, knowing full well that, Lord, though these struggles and afflictions may last for a season or two or perhaps a lifetime, we have the promise of eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. So as we continue to worship you, as we partake of your table, may we be mindful of your goodness and grace and what you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.